realize that in just about five weeks as we hit the month of October, we are going to be right in the middle of reading about the life of Joseph. And so, as me and Max and Ruben were talking about that, thinking about our fall focus, it just occurred to us that that would be a perfect spot for us to do some focused teaching on Joseph. I had to kind of twist my arm a little bit to convince me of that. That's not really true. But, uh, but listen, great story to spend some time looking at a man who had to deal with a lot of adversity, and yet through it all, he was steady, folks. He was steady in the storms. And so for every Sunday morning in October, we're going to be talking about steady in the storm, looking at the life of Joseph to see how he was able to do that and how he can help us. So you mark that down on your calendar and be thinking about that. That will begin in five weeks from today as we get to the month of October. Have that on your heart. We'll be reminding that more about you as we get a little closer to that time. For this morning, I need you to head over to Matthew 7. Will you go there in your Bible? Matthew chapter 7, and we'll read a little bit from there in just a moment. I started out preaching years ago in Huntsville, Texas, and I remember uh, that while I was there, there was this occasion when one of our guys called me, and he said, well, I had some guys come by the house today. Some of those guys wearing white shirts and black ties and little name tags on bicycles. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, a couple of Latter-day Saints had come by, some of these elder boys, and they had talked a little bit about the scriptures with him, and he had invited them to have a Bible study. And when he had finished that, he got on the phone, and he invited me to sit in on the Bible study with them as well. So I was happy to do that, and at the time they arranged, I came to the house, and we sat down together, and we studied with these, with these two young men. And, and for that first study, most of it, we just kind of listened as they told us the story of how their founder, Joseph Smith, had been, had been empowered by God to translate the, the Book of Mormon, how he was a prophet of God, and in addition to translating this book, God had given him many, many other prophecies about what was to come in the future. And it was, it was as they got to that point in the study that we decided we would join in and we would, we would talk a little bit about Joseph Smith's claim that he was a prophet of God. And so we took them over to one of their books, Doctrine and Covenants, I think it's, I think it's 87 where Joseph Smith made a prophecy about the Civil War. He said the Civil War would bring about the end of all nations. I'm pretty sure that didn't happen, aren't you? I kind of expect y'all to react to that a little bit. I don't know, y'all a little flat today? It's a holiday weekend. Just got to sit up, get with me, y'all let me hang up here. We pointed out that that didn't happen. And, and so if he said by what he claimed was the power of God, that something would happen in the future, and it didn't happen, what does the Bible say that he is? A false prophet. That's not me being judgy of him, folks. That's me applying a biblical standard. And so we pointed out there that here's a prophecy that didn't happen. Biblically, he would be a false prophet. And isn't the only one. In fact, we went through three or four examples of where Joseph Smith made prophecies and they didn't come to pass, folks. So don't follow Joseph Smith. He is not a true prophet of God. Well, I'm glad y'all amen that, but they didn't. In fact, in fact, as we went through all of those examples, when we were done, these two young men were completely unfazed and absolutely convicted as much as they'd ever been that this guy was a prophet of God. And so I was a little frustrated. And I finally asked him, I said, what would it take for me to convince you? that he was not a true prophet of God? What evidence would I have to show you to demonstrate that that was so? And one of the guys spoke up without any hesitation at all, and his answer was, if Jesus Christ, only if Jesus Christ were to personally appear to me right here in this living room and say that to me, unless that happens, I won't believe it. And I thought to myself, we're not going to get very far with these guys in our study. But the more they talk to them, the more I begin to understand why they felt that way. Both of these guys believed that God had personally testified to them that the things in the Book of Mormon were true. 
They'd been taught as young men to read the book, to read the whole thing all the way through. And these guys had done that. And then they'd been taught that after you do that, what you do is you pray to God. And when you pray, God will send within you a conviction. There will be a warming in your heart when you pray that prayer that says to you, this is from God. And they'd had that experience. And as a result of that, they were absolutely convinced. This is true. God had personally testified to it. Unless he personally testified to them again in some other way, they weren't going to change their mind. I need to point out this morning that these two young Mormon elders were not the only ones who believed that. And I suspect that you know that true. Because surely along the way, some of you have heard preachers claim that God also personally communicated with them. Maybe you've heard some guys get up and say, you know, I was, I was walking along in the park this week, meditating on what I was going to preach about the sermon, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I should talk to you all about this today. You ever heard somebody say something like that? Yeah. Or if not that dramatic, they'll say something like, well, I was walking in the park, and the Lord laid it on my heart that I should preach this today. I had a friend of mine tell me that. He said, I was on the bus the other day. I was looking across at this guy that, that, that was on the bus with me, and God, God put it on my heart that I should go talk to him. I said, that's interesting. Did, you, did, did God, like, talk to you or something? No, no, no. He said, I'm not hearing voices. But he just, he just in my spirit, told me that that's what I was supposed to do. And so he went and talked to the guy. I studied with a guy one time who was convinced that God was trying to tell him something in his dreams. And so before we begin our Bible study, he said, oh, listen, dude, I had this dream last night. Before we start, let me tell you about it, and I want you to tell me, what do you think God's trying to say? He was convinced that in his dreams, God was trying to speak to him, but he didn't know what the message was. Now, I invited you to Matthew 7 because I want to illustrate, brothers and sisters, how important it is for us to hear God. And so in Matthew 7, will you go all the way to the end of that chapter, down to verse 24? This is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 7 and verse 24, as Jesus wraps up his lesson, he says to his audience, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to the wise man who built his house on the rock. Y'all remember that, right? Mom, nudge your little ones. The wise man built his house upon the rock. That's the guy who hears and does. I'm not doing the hand motions, Petula, not ever, not going to happen. But then look at 26. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. That man won't survive when the storm of judgment comes. That's the warning there. And so what he's emphasizing at the end of this sermon is that you need to hear my words and do what I say, which raises, brothers and sisters, a critical question. If I need to hear God and do what he says, then how is he going to speak to me? Am I going to hear a voice? Is it some kind of feeling I get inside of me? Is that how I know that this is what the Lord wants? Is it in my dreams? How do I figure out what it is that God will do to speak to me and you today? It is vital that we know the answer to that question. And so for a little while this morning, I'd like you to work with me on an answer to that question. And what I'd like to do, we're going to be kind of headed to several places in the Bible, but I want to make this really simple. I really just want to give you three words to answer that question, and primarily three passages. We'll look at more than three, but mainly I want you to see three words and three passages. So I'm going to begin in Hebrews 1. Will you go there first in your Bible? Hebrews 1, and the first word that I want you to think about is the word Jesus. Always a good point to have in a sermon, right? It's particularly relevant to what we're talking about this morning. So I want to begin in Hebrews 1, and we're going to start with the word Jesus. This is Hebrews 1, and we're just going to look at the first two verses. Are you there? Look at this with me. Hebrews 1, verse 1 says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom 
he appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world. So three comments I want to make about those two verses. Number one, can you see that God wants to communicate with us? Do you see that? God does not hold himself aloof. There are some people believe that God made us, but he never said anything. He's just kind of up there in heaven. Well, we don't know what he's doing because he hasn't said anything to us. People see evidence for the Creator, they just don't think He said anything. And here in Hebrews 1, the Bible contradicts that. The Bible says the opposite, that it has been God's desire that we know Him. And so, He speaks to us. In verse 1, we're told that in the Old Testament, He spoke to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions, in many ways. So, go back to the Old Testament, and we find God sending people like, like Jeremiah to communicate His will to the people. God spoke through the prophets, but when it came time for the new covenant, verse 2, you look in there? When it came time for the new covenant, he didn't just send another prophet, right? What God did is he sent his son to communicate his will. Now, here's something important we need to understand about Jesus. Jesus did not just come to be the sacrifice for sin. Surely, surely, that is a vital part of his mission, especially as we need the salvation that sacrifice made possible. But that wasn't the only thing Jesus came to do. So I'm headed back to John 1. Will you go there in your Bible? In John chapter 1, we learn that there was more to this mission. Jesus also came to reveal God to us, to tell us who God is and, and, and what God wants. And so in John chapter 1, look at verse 14. This is John 1, verse 14, and the text says, the Word became flesh. You understand in John 1, when he talks about the Word, he's talking about who? He's talking about Jesus. Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, listen, and we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, not only did he come to save us from our sins, he came to show us God. In fact, look at verse 18 just a little bit further. This is John 1, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. How do we know who God is and what he's like? Look at Jesus. In fact, I would contend that Jesus is the perfect one to explain God to us because, because he is God. In fact, he's still in John 1, back up to the very beginning. John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. Who is the Word? Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God. In fact, in verse 18, he says, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Jesus, there's a common nature with, with the Father. They are both divine. And so, he is perfectly suited to show us who God is. In fact, jump ahead to chapter 14 for just a minute. Again, in the book of John, chapter 14. Do you remember this incident? This is John 14. Look down at verse 8, where Philip says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough. You remember what Jesus said to him? Verse 8, verse 9. Have I been so long with you, and yet you've not come to know me, Philip? You mean we've come this far and you don't get it? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? When we open our Bible and we look at what it reveals about Jesus, who he is, what he is like, we are seeing God. We know about God. We know about the nature of God. But, but that's not saying enough because there was more to what Jesus did than just show us by his life what God is like. He also brings to us a message from God. So again in John, back up to chapter 7, in John chapter 7, this time verse 14, Jesus not only shows us what God is like, but the text also makes clear that Jesus came to bring us a message from God. Brothers and sisters, the Creator does not keep Himself aloof from me and you. He wants us to know Him, and He sent, he sent His Son not only to show us who He is, but to tell us what He wants. Jesus brought us a message from the Father. So, 
This is John 7. Are you there? Verse 14. It says, But when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. And so now he's instructing people. He's bringing this message from God. And in verse 15, the text says, The Jews were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned? Having never been educated, what they wanted to know is, where does this teaching come from? How did he come to know this? He didn't go to seminary. He didn't sit under the feet of one of the rabbis. Where did he get this stuff? Jesus answers that. Are you looking? This is chapter 7, verse 16. So Jesus answered and said, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. You see that? I came to bring you a message from God. That's what Jesus claimed. And you know how we know that's true? Because he rose from the dead. And frankly, if Jesus died and rose from the dead and said, I have a message from God, I am inclined to believe that. How about you? And so through Jesus Christ, not only do we learn what God is, but we have this message that comes from God. And listen, folks, the people who heard Jesus, they got that point. If you will go back one more time to Matthew 7, again, to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7 Verses 28 and 29, as, as Matthew summarizes the sermon, I want you to listen to what he said. He said, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as one of his scribes. They just knew it. I don't think they've quite put it all together yet and really understand why he's different, but they know he is not like any other teacher. Can you imagine? what it would have been like not to go back and read these words as you and I can today, but to have been on the scene, to have been sitting in the crowd, listening as God in the flesh said, here is my message for you. That'd be awesome. And yet, brothers and sisters, that is exactly our problem. We are unable to do that because after Jesus died and rose, we know from Acts 1 that he ascended back to the Father. He is not here. And I can't go to him and sit at his feet and ask, what is this message that, that God wants us to know? And so we haven't answered our question yet, have we? We still don't know how God speaks to us today. Yes, it began with Jesus but he isn't here for us today, not like he was in the first century. So we still need to know how he speaks to me and you today. And so I need to move on to a second word and a second text. My second word is the word apostles, and my second text is John 14. So head over there to John chapter 14. Let me give you a little background that will help us understand what's transpiring here in John 14. John is bringing us right to the end of Jesus' life, okay? We are, we are hours away from, from the crucifixion. And here in John 14, Jesus is, is doing his best to prepare these guys for what's about to happen that they don't understand, that's just going to rock their world. He's doing his best to prepare them for what's about to happen and, and to prepare them for the work that is going to follow when all this is over. And so that's what's going on in John chapter 14. And I want you to look now at verse number 16, because as Jesus prepares them, he makes them a promise. He's going to be leaving. We said that, right? He's going to ascend to the Father. But he's not going to leave them alone. Verse 16, he says to them, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So first of all, Jesus said, I'm going to leave, but I will, I will send another helper. I'm not leaving you alone. The Holy Spirit is going to come, and he will help you. What would the Spirit do for them? Well, let's keep reading because Jesus talks about that. He doesn't just say that a helper's coming. He says what the helper will do. So jump down to verse 25. Let's pick up the story. This is verse 25 of John 14. Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, 
but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So all I want you to see in verse 26 is that Jesus is concerned with the very question we raised. After he's gone, how do men hear God? How do they get this message that Jesus brought? And he said, well, the Spirit is going to come. And the Spirit's going to do two things. You look at John 14 and verse 26 and see if these two things are there. First of all, he says, when the Spirit comes, he will bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Do you see that? Do you think they were worried about that? I mean, they'd been with Jesus all this time. How many things must he have taught them over the three years that they spent together? Would you want to be responsible to remember all that? I mean, if he says he's about to go, I'm thinking, no. Uh, how will we know? And he said, don't sweat it. I'm sending the Spirit. And he's going to bring to your remembrance everything that I said. He'll help you recall it. But he would do something else. Do you see it? He would do a second thing. The Spirit will also reveal to them all truth. What is that? We get a little help further in this story. If you look ahead to John 16, what does Jesus mean when he's going to have the Spirit reveal all truth? Look at chapter 16 and verse 12. We have some more insight. Again, same occasion, Jesus says to his disciples, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. The truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. That's interesting. When Jesus came and taught, he didn't teach them everything. In fact, you kind of get this idea when Jesus talks about the Spirit revealing all truth, that there is a body of truth, that this message from God is not like a run-on sentence that goes forever and ever. There is a body of truth that he wants his people to have, all truth that's going to be revealed to them. And he says when the Spirit comes, he will reveal all of that to you. Do you see it? They weren't ready for all of it. Appreciate this this point. They have no idea about the resurrection. <laughs> they should. And what all of that meant and what it would accomplish, not till Acts 2. He said, when the Spirit comes, he will reveal all truth to you. So now we know what the work of the Spirit is going to be. He will remind them of what Jesus said, and he'll give them the rest of the message. Now, when we move on through the New Testament, folks, we find that that is exactly what the Holy Spirit does. So let me give you two other passages. First, 1 Corinthians 2. Will you go there? That was the promise made in John 14, 15, and 16. And as we move into the New Testament epistles, what we find is that's exactly what happened. After Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit came, and he's guiding the apostles into all the truth. Paul, in fact, points to the Spirit as the sort of his, source of his message. This is 1 Corinthians 2. Go down to verse 12. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12. Paul says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. When Paul's explaining his message, he said, I didn't learn this by going to college. I didn't get this in the world. Where I got my message is from who? The Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus said he would come and do that. The Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. You see it? God had a message he wanted his people to have. Paul said the Spirit has given it to us. That's exactly what Jesus said would happen. In fact, in verse 13, he says, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. It's not like Paul came, or the Holy Spirit came along and said, hey, Paul, why don't you write something about women being submissive today? No, the very words Paul wrote and spoke by the power of the Spirit were the words of God. And listen, people understood that. One more passage, 1 Thessalonians, will you go there? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul commends the Thessalonians in chapter 2 and verse 13 because they have this all figured out. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, Paul says, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the Word of God, which also performs its perfect work in you who believe. I always thought that's a fascinating passage 
because because Paul said, when we men came preaching, you did not receive our message as the word of men, even though we men were preaching it to you. But you recognized what it really is. They knew that because of the miracles Paul performed. You recognized it as the word of God. And I got to tell you, folks, that's not just some fringe theological issue to be debated in some seminary somewhere. This is vital information. We have been saying all year that the Creator, because He is the Creator, has a right to tell us what to do, right? That's all the way back at the beginning in Genesis. And so if these are the Creator's words, they carry authority. What Paul says is Thessalonians got that. They understood. And so back to the slide. Will you look up there again? The message first came through Jesus, and yet Jesus died and rose again and ascended to the Father. And when that happened, John 14 says he sent the Spirit so that that message would be carried on by the apostles so it could continue to be be preached and so that men would have everything God wanted them to know. But you see the problem, don't you? Wouldn't it be great to go sit at the feet of the Apostle Paul and listen to a Spirit-guided men tell us exactly what God wants us to know? So where do you go and do that? Is he like over in Tunisia somewhere? See, all the men who were inspired by God, they're all dead. Been dead a long, long time. You can't even go to their grave. We don't know where that is. Certainly not going to hear anything. So the question we started with is still unanswered, right? We know it came first through Jesus, and when he left, the Spirit passed it on to the apostles, but now they're gone too. What about me and you? You know what's coming, right? Good Bible students on a holiday weekend, you're sitting in a church building at 1124, right? You know what my next word's going to be. What is it? The Bible's a good guess, but that isn't it. Close, though. Second, third word is Scripture. Last text text is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. You know why I'm going here, right? Listen, the, the apostles... We're also concerned with the very question that we're raising today. After we are gone, how will people continue to know the message? In fact, before I go to 2 Timothy, I want to go to 2 Peter. Will you look there in your Bible, 2 Peter chapter 1? 2 Peter 1, look down at verse 12. And I want you to see that Peter's wrestling with the same thing we are this morning. 2 Peter 1, verse 12, Peter says, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. That's real fancy language for Peter saying, I know I'm getting ready to die. As also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. Peter says, I'm writing to you so that after I am gone, you will be able to remember. And so as we think about this message, this body of truth God wanted everyone to have, Jesus first brought it, brought part of it. And then when he was gone, the Spirit was sent so the apostles could share all of the message, the complete picture with God's people. But after they were dead and gone, that message was preserved because it was recorded. It was written down. So men of all time, like me and you, would have access to it. And yet, why is 2 Timothy 3.16 important? Will you look at that text? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all Scripture is what? Inspired by, inspired by God. Even the process of recording this message was not left to men. The Holy Spirit watched over that process so that the words recorded were, in fact, the very words of God. Listen, folks, that's critical for us to understand. When we read the Bible, we are not reading Jeremiah's observations about the culture of his day. Second Peter 2, or 1, down in verses 20 and 21, tell us that those men were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God. And so we get to the first century, when men like Paul wrote all of these letters. Paul was, a, listen, when Paul wrote that stuff about subjection, ladies, 
That's not because he was a single guy and was mad because no woman would have him. That's not what that's about. Whatever Paul said about subjection, the very words he recorded were words given to him about the Holy Spirit. So if you don't like the subjection part, your problem isn't with Paul. It's with God. Because those are his words. And when I quibble with things that are in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, my quibble is with God. Because they are his words. What we've said this morning is absolutely vital. If you go back to the beginning and remember that if the Creator has spoken, He has the authority, His right to tell us what to do. And that gives great significance, brothers and sisters, to the words in the book. It is through the words in the book that God speaks to me and you today. My Mormon friends that we studied with so many years ago my Mormon friends were misled. Whatever they may have felt in their spirit after reading the Book of Mormon, I don't know what that was. But I know what it wasn't. It was not a confirmation from God that that was true. And I don't mean to be harsh and judgmental and unkind when I say that. I know that wasn't from God because that isn't the way God speaks today. And it's vital that we know that, folks. It's not how God works. In fact, can you imagine the religious chaos is if truth is only known to be true if it feels true to us? It wouldn't work, would it? And by the way, brothers and sisters, you and I need to remember that too. I've encountered some people over the years who seem, to, who seem to believe how they felt about truth is how they knew what was true. That just can't be so because that just doesn't feel right to me. Just pause and think about what a terrible standard that would be. It's not about how we feel. In fact, I'll tell you the truth. Sometimes we do not feel good about truth. But what makes it so is whether or not God said it. And he's going to say it to me with a voice or a dream or some inner nudge. He's going to say it in the book. See, that message was first spoken by Jesus, and then after he was gone, it was passed on by the Spirit to the apostles, and then that Spirit guided those apostles to record it and preserve it so that me and you could have that message today. Folks, it's what's in the book that tells us what is true. It's in the book that God speaks to me and you today. And brothers and sisters, it is vital that we hear his voice. Because if your life is off the path, you're doing things that are contrary to what's in the book. It's sin. It's sin because the maker said it's sin. And we need to repent of those sins. We need to bring them to God. We need to ask him to forgive us. Why? Because that's what he said to do in the book. And if we've never responded to him, if we're not a disciple, what did he say to do? He said, you believe on my son Jesus as your Savior, and you determine to change your life. And I want you to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Not because they do that in churches of Christ, but because God spoke in the the book, and he said, that's what you need to do. And so what we urge you to do today is to listen to God in his book. And if you need to obey it, we'd urge you to hear him today and respond to him. If you need to do that, you make your way to the front right now while we stand, while we sing.